may be seated. Turn to Romans chapter 9 this morning. We'll be looking in, in this chapter once again. I just want you to know that every time I, I get up here to preach, uh, I feel a little bit of a, a trembling sensation, and it's not because I'm afraid of talking. Uh, those that know me know I can talk. Um, but when we're talking about the deep truths of God, when we're looking at the Scripture, when I have a responsibility to say exactly what God says, nothing more, nothing less, that fills me with trembling. Um, and so even though I don't say this every week, I do cover your prayers throughout the week, but also on Sunday, uh, that I would be faithful to God's word. Romans chapter 9, verse 14, I want to begin reading in this morning. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and whom I will and, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. I'll give a quick introduction uh, not to this text, but just to uh, the scripture in general this morning. I thought it'd be good to do that. Think about this with me. Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of God, is both uh, human and divine. That's a fundamental orthodox understanding of scripture. The humanity of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus being absolute in both aspects. Not partial one and impartial of the other. Not a mixture of the two, but wholly both. He is the living revelation to man of God. All that we can know of God is manifested in the person, the personality, the desires, the actions, and the will of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that no man hath seen God at any time, but that Jesus Christ reveals the unseen God, the one that no one has seen. Therefore, we call him, as Christians, we often call Jesus the living, eternal word. John calls him this word. He says, this word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten, or that glory which belongs only to God, full of grace and truth. But Jesus Christ, after having atoned for sins, and after having raised from the dead, commissioned true disciples to make his name known, and to publish the gospel of his grace, his sacrifice, to the whole world. And then Jesus Christ, the living word, the revelation of God to man, left our earth. The revelation left. He ascended to heaven where, I, 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 thankfully, even though he's not here, he's not that he's inactive because now while he is in heaven, he is constantly interceding and mediating for his true disciples in a constant work of Christ, pleading for us, his payment, pleading his payment for us. But before he left, he promised to give his disciples, the apostles, the Holy Spirit to guide, convict, encourage, illuminate, his word. But these men had the Spirit in a different way than even we do today. The promise to guide them, he said, Jesus promised he would guide them into all truth and they wouldn't have need of any man to teach them. That was not a promise given to us. Okay? That was a promise given to the disciples. And what that promise entailed was this when the Spirit of truth would come, he would come upon these holy men in such a way that they're using their thoughts, their attitudes, their demeanors, their way of doing things. He would, through them, pen holy scripture. He would guide them into all truth concerning the revelation of God. They would then write that truth down. They wouldn't need a man to teach them because the Holy Spirit would be the one to give them this truth. When the apostles died... They had finished the truth God wanted us to have, and so he did not, the Holy Spirit does not um, inspire in that same way. He does not give us further revelation. 
because he finished it with those individuals. They completed it. This is seen throughout much of the New Testament. This is evidenced throughout the book of Acts. And, and then in the book, after the book of Acts and Revelation and other books of the Bible, it evidences that this is the fullness of God's revelation of himself. Well, it's very interesting then, if while on earth Jesus is the living word, fully God, fully man, a work of God, a work of man, the revelation of God, that when he left, he sent his Holy Spirit to reveal to these men the written word, which is both a human and a divine book. The written word of God, just like the living word, is used, is, is written by men, but in, in, in a very mysterious way, a way that I can't fully understand. We don't know how it happened. You, given by men, and yet exactly the words that God wanted. It's a miracle. It's a supernatural work. And this is what we have. The reason I wanted to bring this up this morning is because God used, in the inscripturating of his word, God used normal people, their gifts, their talents, their abilities to give exactly what he wanted us to know. He did so with the Apostle Paul. And that is why Romans 9, 10, and 11, we have to somewhat understand how Paul writes in order to understand God's word. Um, Paul is very logical. He's very much ties each thing together with the previous. He doesn't give an outline so much as he gives bullet points along the main purpose. Understanding that idea, that way of God giving us his holy word in Romans, well, I think will help us to understand these chapters 9, 10, and 11. The human vehicle that God used and prepared more than any other in the New Testament period was this Apostle Paul to give us his holy word. And no inspired letter compares to God's use of Paul in writing other than Romans for its depth, its clarity, its explanation of the gospel. This doesn't mean it's the best book or it's better than, superior than other books of the Bible, other letters in the Bible. Rather, it is the most extensive explanation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, inspired by the Holy Spirit and penned using a brilliant, logical, and vocal defender of the faith, Paul the Apostle. What a tremendous, just, just even if that's all we think of today, what a tremendous truth that God gave us his word through men. That he used the vehicle of men to give us his holy, divine word. I like that because being a human, it's for me. He used humans because humans can communicate with me. <laughs> but I like that because it's divine. And therefore it's not Paul's words, it's God's words. And that's just a tremendous truth. It's something that I think comes together, and yet it's not always that easy to understand. It should come as no surprise, then, if this is the greatest or, or the largest um, extensive explanation of the gospel, that after having taught the truths of the gospel dramatically and clearly and articulately and completely in Romans 1 through 8, that God would cause Paul to use his personal logic, his way, his apologia, to defend the gospel from erring questions and to defend God, the author of the gospel. And that's what Romans 9 through 11 is about. It's a, it's a theodicy, if you care for big words. It's, it means a defense of God. That's exactly what Paul does here. It's a defense of God and his character because of his authority in the gospel. And then he reminds us in chapter 10 of the responsibility of man to believe this gospel. And then finally, an explanation in chapter 11 of how the nation of Israel and the church is reconciled in God's plan. Right after this, for the rest of the book, 12 through 16, Paul will apply the faith of the gospel to the Christian's everyday living. He'll apply it to us in a very practical way. But before he goes on to intensely practical aspects, living as God's church with the gospel as our motivation... Paul uses, or God has Paul use his gift of logic and reason to reinforce the authority and sovereignty of God in the gospel. You could sum up Romans 9, 10, and 11 any way. It would be this way. We learn from these three chapters, it's God's gospel. It's his. And he controls it. And he is authoritative. And God is God. And we are not. And that is the, really the summation of all that.
I think that's one phrase that should always be on the tips of our tongue as we read these texts in Romans chapter 9. God is God alone and we are not. Therefore, any glory that we might have, and we do have a certain amount of glory, an elevation, a lifting up, an encouragement, because of being connected to God in salvation, is based completely on God's free and sovereign grace and mercy alone. We seek to understand God so that we might adore Him. But we will never fully comprehend the workings of His will. We will never fully comprehend that. We will never fully comprehend and get an absolute, a absolute understanding to where we have no more questions concerning God's purposes. We will never, with our minds, fully contain the person of the Almighty, incomprehensible one. But Paul has previously shown in this chapter, we looked at these before, these texts before, he's shown that God, God's choosing, God's election, is never a mistake. God chose the nation of Israel to be the blessers of mankind, to be the special na national recipients of his love, but he chose all believers, regardless of their ethnicity, skin tone, gender, to be the recipients of his love as well. In other words, not all who we might think are chosen are truly chosen. This is Romans chapter 9. Not all Israel is true Israel, he says. Not all who claim to be disciples are true disciples. We must not forget that true disciples are those whom God has chosen to be his disciples and that's evidenced through their following of him, their repentance and faith in him. I think sometimes this paradox can frustrate us humans or at least, us, at least cause us to question and to wonder. But faith is trusting God even if we don't fully comprehend his choice. And two examples of that in Romans 9 are Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Esau. Abraham had two sons from two different women, and God chose Isaac through Sarah, not Ishmael through Hagar, to set his efficacious, his, his efficient love upon him. Not because Isaac was better than Ishmael, but so that the promise of God made through Sarah and Abraham would stand. That's why God chose Isaac, because he promised it. God will fulfill his promise. The other example of God's sovereignty is, is seen in choosing Jacob, not Esau. But this one is even different than the previous because Isaac and Rebekah both fulfilled the requirements of the promise. And it was through one marriage bed with one man and one woman that the twins, Jacob and Esau, were born. And yet God chose Jacob to set his purpose love upon long before either one could do good or evil, he says in Romans chapter 9. And this was so that the purposes of God, according to election, would stand. And so we learn from God's choice that it's his choice is based on his desired promise and his desired purpose. And since he is God, who are we to call into question his promise and his purpose? That's the whole emphasis here. And there are two main questions in the text that we're going to look at today and then next week preemptively addressed by Paul. I say preemptively because I don't know if they really were asked, but Paul in this letter assumes they will be asked. And so preemptively he addresses these two questions. The first question is found in verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Or another way to put that, is God unjust? Is he not just because he chose Jacob over Esau? Or another way to put it, is God fair? It's not fair, some might suggest. Why didn't he choose Esau? It's not fair for Esau. That's the first question. The second question is found, out, found down in verse 19. Thou wilt say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? That's God. If God's purposes are his purposes, and we'll look at that today, then how can he blame me? How could he find fault? How could he say, I'm responsible for my sin? The two questions that are posed are, is God fair, is God ju just, and is God to blame for man's rejection? Now, he'll answer those questions, and we'll look at the first one this week. But really, those two questions, when asked by the individual who is uh, criticizing God, who is calling into question God, are a mark of a mistake in two areas. The first one is a misunderstanding of who God is. 
And the second one is a misunderstanding of who man is. First one doesn't contemplate just who God really is. And the second one is not willing to acknowledge just who man really is. So those two aspects, and let me say this morning, my friends, that if we are off on who God is, and if we are off, or if we are off on who man is, we're way off. That's two fundamental questions, right? Two fundamental truths. Who is God and who is man? And so Paul really gets to the fundamental understanding here with these questions. So he's basically saying, okay, you're going to ask me uh, about God. You're going to call into question God's justice, God's character, God's veracity. We need to understand who God is. And then you're going to call into question man's person, who man really is, man's abilities. We're going to discuss then who man really is. And in the end, the desired result is to say, God is God alone, and I am not. I find this fascinating because that's the approach Paul takes in answering these questions. In other words, his approach is not to go into some lengthy discussion as to inner workings of how election and predestination and man's will and man's responsibility and God's choice, how all these things jive together. His answer is basically, God is God. Stop arguing with him. <laughs> I'm not saying I always like that answer. Maybe, I'm, maybe you're a little bit like me and don't always like the answers God gives. But it's the answer given by the Spirit of God through the Apostle Paul. So let's look at that first one. Let's look at that first perspective, first question. And then the goal today is to see from this text of Scripture a little bit more clearly who God is. And I hope that we go away today rejoicing, having known greater our God. Because let me tell you something that I have learned and I'm still learning. Almost every struggle of my life, almost every lack of faith in my life, every sin problem that I routinely deal with is because I, my eyes of faith are not fixed on the person of God. And so it's going to be good for me, and I hope good for you, for us to be, have a little bit clearer idea of who God is today. The question, let's look at the question first. Is there injustice? Is there unrighteousness with God? Is God fair for choosing Jacob over Esau, or is that a travesty of justice? And Paul doesn't excuse God's choice, nor does he uh, suggest that maybe God could have or should have chosen differently. Instead, he answers first with just a simple, powerful affirmation. Did you see it in the text? What's his answer right away? Don't even ask that question, right? God, God forbid, meganoito, may it never be. Perish the thought. Don't contemplate this, that God is unjust. In fact, his answer is a resounding no. And that phrase is found throughout the book of Romans over and over again. And we've looked at it before. But that phrase in the Greek is just two words. Me genoita or genoito. And it is the idea of become never. <laughs> now, I, I believe the translators, the, the King James translators, in seeking to find the strongest way possible to express this, used their uh, English idiomatic language to say God forbid because God or forbid is not in the Greek. And I think it's a valid translation because it's saying God forbid that we would even say this. May it never be. It's not the idea of, well, try to forget about those thoughts. It's the idea, don't for a moment begin to call into question the character of God. I guess this does start to get to the rest of the question, right? Just who do we think we are that we can call into question the character of God? It's a pretty high view of man to think that we can call into question what God does. God forbid, may it never be. That's a simple answer. And that's it. Don't even go there. 
Paul first must establish the truth that there is nothing immoral or unrighteous about God's choosing. Why? Because he's God. If anybody has the right to choose what he chooses, it's God. Now note this. That which Paul says, that which we will examine today, will not, catch this, will not reconcile the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man in our minds. That's not Paul's intention, to reconcile it. It's a holy paradox, a mystery that is beyond our human comprehension. But it will, Paul's answer will hopefully give us a sense of peace. That as we learn why, as we learn who our God is, we can learn why we can trust him even if we don't fully understand his ways. And so Paul gives the answer, may it never be, right? And then he gives two arguments regarding that answer. The first argument is, know your God. Both arguments are, know your God. And know this, that God is a God full of mercy. God is a God full of mercy. A declarative statement quoting God's conversation with Moses in Exodus chapter 33 is what we find in verse 15. For he saith to Moses, that's Exodus 33, 19, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now let me, let me just rephrase this for you. According to the original language, I think brings a, a certain brightness to this, a certain uh, explanation to this, because he does do something different than we see in the English language here. He starts it with that phrase, I will have mercy. That word will, will have mercy, it's one word. I will, it's one word, I will have mercy. And it is the future tense. You know what future means, right? It means the determined purpose of God. I will have mercy. And then he says, on whom I will have mercy. But you know, this is a different, this is a different verb altogether. He says, I will have mercy. It's a present, um, I mean, sorry, it's a perfect, I'm, my Greek's all messed up in my head. It is an indicative future tense. Future and very, very and declarative. All right? But the next word, when he says, on whom I will have mercy, is a subjunctive mood. In other words, you might be able to translate it this way. I will, I have determined to have mercy on whom I should have mercy. You see, the subjunctive is not so much showing the determined purpose of God, but is showing the morality of his purpose. I have determined to show mercy on those who I should show mercy to. And he says the same thing with compassion. And I will have compassion on those I should have compassion upon. What he is saying here is the concept of this. Just catch this. He's saying... I know whom I should have mercy upon, and therefore I will have mercy upon them. And I know whom I should have compassion upon, and I will have compassion upon them. It reminds me of some, of some personal experiences that I had in my life. It reminds me of going for a car ride with my child, my oldest, and he questions my driving. Why did you turn down here, Dad? This isn't where our house is. Why are you going here? Why did you put your blinker on? Why is the stereo on? Why is that song playing? I love the fact that he is seeking to learn. But sometimes I just turn to him and say, I am driving. I will drive how I should drive. <laughs> we have a word for that, right? Backseat drivers. Trust me, my son. Trust me. I know the illustrations never work perfectly when we're speaking of the human and the divine. But in a crass way, the same is true of the eternal God of the universe. In my infinite wisdom and power, I will have mercy on whom I should have mercy. Trust me, my son. Trust me. Part of the problem is that we, that we have with God's elections, I think sometimes we think that everyone deserves a chance to be born again. And that somehow, somehow we're all in some amoral middle jar of humanity. Right? I think of it as like gumballs. We're in this middle jar of humanity, this amoral. And on the left you have destruction and hell and condemnation. And on the right you have glory and eternity and heaven. And God is randomly picking us out of one. Well, we'll put him in judgment. We'll put him in righteousness. We'll put him in judgment. We'll put him in righteousness. But get rid of that thought completely from your mind because there's not three jars. Okay? There's two. There's two. 
Jesus said in John chapter 3 that those that don't believe in him are already in condemnation. There's not some amoral mass where we're innocent and he's moving us from one to the other. We are in condemnation, and, and not randomly, we'll get to that in a minute, but he is pulling those whom he should have mercy out of condemnation and putting them into righteousness. He's giving them the ability to believe and to receive, and he, he, he is electing them and he's regenerating them, and he's doing the entire work himself. But it's not that he's putting people into condemnation. All of mankind is already in condemnation. Think of it this way. The governor is under no obligation to pardon any criminal. But neither is he under any obligation to pardon all the criminals. If he chooses to pardon some, while allowing the rest to pay their well-deserved debt, does that make him unrighteous or unfair? No, we are plagued in our society with the concept of fairness or a perceived concept of fairness in our society today. But God is not obligated to any of us. People don't deserve a second chance for redemption because people don't deserve a, deserve a first chance of redemption. It is all of God's mercy, all of God's grace, all because he will have mercy on whom he should have mercy. There's one thing we have to get in our, like I said, this is not going to reconcile the sovereignty of man, the sovereignty of God and responsibility of man in our minds. But what the intent of Paul is to point out to say, when you ask this question, it betrays a fundamental problem with trusting God. Believing that God is God. And so in a sense, God is saying, trust me, Moses. Now, the events in which God says this to Moses is fascinating. It's when Moses, it's when, it's when God has seen the sin of the people. The people have rejected him. God has said, go up to the land, but I'm not going with you. And Moses goes and meets with God, and he says, if you're not going to go with us, then don't send us up. But go with us. Go with us. He pleads with God. And God, in his sovereignty, listens to his servant Moses. And he responds by saying, I will go up and I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And then you remember what happens next in that account? Moses turns to, turns to the voice of God, doesn't turn to his person, and he says, show me your glory. You see, Moses wanted to know more of the glory and mercy and goodness of God after God says, I'm in charge, I'll do it. We need a high view of God. And I believe this concept of God's election, of God's mercy, should affect our evangelism. So what I mean by this is we often use phrases like this, and please don't think I am coming down hard on anyone. I do the same thing. We'll say things like, I gave my, my life to Jesus. Or I decided that, that Jesus could save me and be my Savior. As if Jesus is up in heaven saying, oh goody, you know, I was so hoping they would because I need them so much. In other words, we sometimes phrase things in such a way that it emphasizes ourselves. And in so doing, when we emphasize ourselves, there is a tendency to de-emphasize God. I believe instead of us saying, I gave my heart to Jesus, we ought to be falling on our knees and crying out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what we need more of. We are wretches, and the amazing grace of God saves wretches, not qualified candidates. Well, how could we impress the sovereign God of the universe? By our choice, by our decisions. I'm not saying, as I said last week, I believe there is a, there is a balance, there is an understanding of man's responsibility in all of this. I don't know how it fully comprehends, how, how it works all together. We'll get to that in Romans chapter 10, so you just have to hold on and stay for the entire study of Romans before you determine what theology I believe. But that's the first argument. God is a God of mercy. The first argument that Paul gives when people question the justice of God says, you don't know God because God's a God of mercy. 
and he will give mercy on those whom he will give mercy. Trust God's mercy. The second argument is that God is not only a God of mercy, God is a God of purpose. He's a God of purpose. Look at the second argument. Interesting enough, here's the counter to the, him speaking to Moses. He speaks to Pharaoh. He speaks to Moses and says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Then he speaks to Pharaoh and says something else. Pharaoh, of course, the one who Moses was his, well, you know, it was his nemesis. Uh, the antithesis of Moses was Pharaoh. Moses was to lead God's people out. Pharaoh was to keep God's people in. And so I think it's ironic that Paul would use this to kind of show the difference between the two. Although God's choosing of men to salvation is according to his infinite wisdom and will, it might appear to be random according to God's critics, but election, God's choosing, is not random. It's not random. That doesn't mean it's based on us, but it's not random. All right? These verses are very clear that God's showing of mercy to souls lost in darkness of sin is perfectly orchestrated according to the eternal purposes of God. In contrast to Moses, God also spoke to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh would not release God's people, the Israelites, to worship in the promised land. And it was because his heart was hardened, the Bible says. At first it appears, if you read through the plagues, that this was just the bent of Pharaoh, as is all humanity's bent to be hardened, unless God softens the heart. But nine times it says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And three of those times... It says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And this verse in the New Testament explains that. God told Pharaoh about the middle of the plagues, that God had given Pharaoh everything in Egypt, the control, the power, the wealth, the position, for a purpose. He said, I've given it for the purpose of making God's name great among all nations. Which is precisely why, if you go back and study the, the plagues and the, the whole thing with in Exodus, um, each one of the plagues was a targeted attack of God upon the gods of Egypt. Proving that he is God alone. And the gods of Egypt have nothing in comparison. He embarrassed the gods of Egypt. That was his purpose. That was his intent. And in this verse he says, and notice the very words of the scripture, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up. I gave you everything Pharaoh, to declare my name among the people. I gave you everything. I raised you up to power, not for your power, but that I might show my power in thee, or through you, I would show my power, and that my name might be declared through all the earth. I love the literal translation of this when I was translating this week, so that my name would be published. It's the word of screamed out, yelled out, far and wide in all the earth so that my name is published far and wide. You see, God's purpose was bigger even than the children of Israel, wasn't it? Wasn't it bigger than them? It was the publishing of his name in all the earth. God raised up Pharaoh so that God's power would be seen so that far and wide his name would be published. Yes, God is a God of mercy, but he is also a God who has plans beyond our comprehension in our short lives. This plan is as eternal as God himself. But we are temporal. So how can we think that our temporal half-lives have the right to question God's motive and purposes? By the way, get into this with the next question about who do we think we are. So the thing formed, say to him that formed it, why have you made me thus? Who do we think we can that we can reply against God? It's like me sitting in the cockpit of a 747 telling the pilot how to fly the plane. You better hope that if that ever happens, you're not on that plane. That makes no sense. I'm not qualified. Neither are we qualified to question God's purposes. We're not qualified. You might put it this way. It's way beyond our pay scale. <laughs> he uses this saying, God uses the same argument when he speaks to Job. And he uses the same argument. And he, he goes on this, in a sense, this rampage in saying, just one right after the other. So Job, were you the one that taught the storks how to migrate? Were you the one that gave Leviathan his strength and behemoth? Were you, were you, tell me, tell me if you were there. Did you put the stars in heaven? 
Tell me, Job, he says that over and over, tell me. Declare if thou knowest it. And then he shows himself. And at the end of it all, you know what Job's response is? I repent and abhor myself. <laughs> he got a good view of God, and they give him a clear view of himself. He uses that same argument right here. Pharaoh, I raised you up to declare my name in all the earth, not yours. We might think, or we might say to a teenager, the world doesn't revolve around you. And one of the reasons why men do not like this doctrine, let me back up, one of the reasons why sometimes I do not like this doctrine is because I like to think the world revolves around me. I like to think that that's why everything happens. But the reality is, God promised that all things would work together for good. But working together is the idea of work together according to his eternal purposes. Not because I like it, I want it. Makes sense to me. Don't get me wrong. The doctrine of God's election is both intensely humbling and very much uplifting too as well. Think of it this way. Why would he choose me? That's humbling. But then think of it this way. Why would he choose me? That's uplifting. It's both. It is mind-boggling, humiliating. But it also is intensely uplifting. That the God of the universe, who chose to involve me in his eternal purposes, God's purpose is, is for his glory to be manifested far and wide on, the, on all the earth. If you have any questions whatsoever as to what God's eternal perfect purpose is, Romans 9.17 clears that up, right? My name published. My name declared. That's the purpose. <coughs> this is God's purpose, is for his, his glory to be manifested far and wide in all the earth. <coughs> and catch this. This is done. God is glorified. His name is magnified, both through the pardon of sinners and through the judgment of sinners. God is glorified by the presence of heaven, and God is glorified by the presence of hell. God is glorified by both. Now, we don't usually think of it that way, do we? But who created hell? God did. And did he not do for so for a purpose? And I believe if the purpose of God in creating heaven was for his glory, the purpose of God in creating hell was for his glory. Because God does everything with the purpose of his glory. His name being magnified. I may not understand it. I may not always like it. It's what the Bible says. The purpose for the raising up of even an individual like Pharaoh was not for Pharaoh. It was for God's purposed glory to be manifested in all the earth. And whether I like it or not, the reason that I am alive today is not for me. It's for the purpose of God's glory being published and magnified in all the earth. And listen to this. This is true. It's hard to grasp, but it's true. If that means that I should be judged and spend an eternity in hell for the glory of God, then that's fine with God. I must trust Him. Now, I don't want that. I don't want that for anyone. And that's why I believe in man's responsibility. I cry out and I say, come to Jesus. Hide away in the love of Jesus. Repent and believe in Him. But the reality is, I cannot, I'm not saying I'm excited for people to be in hell, but I cannot apologize for that which God ordained. And God ordained judgment as well as he ordained grace. So that's for the glory and praise of God. And all these things, we must be careful to simply agree with Scripture. The plain sense thereof and not deviate to the right hand of hyper brothers, a fatalism that denies man's responsibility, nor to the left hand of man-centered brothers, making it all about man's decision and choices. But we must be balanced in understanding that in God's election, his infinite justice and mercy and wisdom wins the day. There was recently a book out by a guy named Rob Bell. You don't need to read the book. It's tragic. Um, I mean, it's tragic. I haven't read all of it. I read parts of it. It's tragic in the sense of heresy, but it's all tragic because it's just poorly written, too. The book is called Love Wins. 
And the essence of this individual, this pastor's argument, is that ultimately God won't send anyone to hell because love wins. There's so much wrong with that book. But better than love winning is the truth that God wins. God wins. God will not ultimately deny himself. Therefore, his election reveals himself to be a God of mercy and a God of purpose. And I'm glad that this is the kind of God I serve. A God who is truly God. And not just an elevated man, but God alone. One who is divinely merciful and divinely purposed to accomplish his plan of receiving perfect glory. In closing, if you do not know this God as our Lord and Savior, if you have never called upon him, then I implore you today to cry out, God, be merciful to be a sinner. And he will be merciful and he will be glorified. Praise God for his grace, his mercy, and his purpose, his determination. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, it rebukes me and encourages me. It humbles me and it uplifts me. Because in your word, in this passage of scripture, I see that you will have mercy on whom you will have mercy and whom you will, you harden. Why? How is that amazing? How, how is that possible? I don't understand that. But I know that it proves your, your ma magnificent name. I know it proves that you are God and you are wise and you are infinite and you are just and you are merciful. So God, I pray that you would draw sinners to yourself. I pray that today if there are sinners within our midst, we're all sinners, but if there are those that are yet in their sins, there are those that are yet unrepentant, unregenerate. I pray that you would give them the repentance and faith to believe in you. And it would be all of you. And you would receive all the glory for that. Lord, there is none that are so far from you they cannot be redeemed. And there are no, none so good that they don't need to be redeemed. And so, Lord God, I pray for your redemption of your people, even today. Help us, Lord, even as we try to understand these deep truths of reconciling God's will and man's responsibility, I pray you'd help us to stay true to the scripture, to not allow our emotions or our reasonings, either one, to take precedence over your holy word. And I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.